Greetings to everyone who is watching this video. Hey, Sam. Good evening. How you doing, Sam? I'm alive. A little out of it, but it is what it is. I'll be okay. It's par for the course being a mother and in Corona world. It's not the Corona. Well, it's, I'm just sick of hearing about Corona. I'm sick of reading about Corona. I'm sick of the cases. I just want this to be over and done with. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's other stuff too, just tiredness and stuff. And yes, being a mom is wonderful, but at the end of the day, when they go to bed, I'm not angry. It's nice. I love you, baby. <laughs> you know I love you, right? Oh, I'm talking to my daughter, sorry. Hey, but don't worry, Eli, I adore you too as an older brother. All right. Diana, is that a picture of you as opposed to a video? I'm sorry? Yeah. Nice. Oh. So oh, Bianca wow. has posted a picture. I didn't know I could do that. You know, if I could just put a picture of myself and then I, yeah. I could just pretend to be out here, it would be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can, you can, in your attempt, you can put in a profile picture. Nice. Would you, right. would you I prefer will, to put um, my video on? No, you can do whatever you want. That's your, okay. your privacy, you know? Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I think it looks nice. It's, it's, uh, it's a good idea. Yes. That was a professional photo done in. It's already from 2018, so. Nice. Hopefully I still look like that. <laughs> oh my goodness, is that Sean? <laughs> hey, Sean. <clears throat> I haven't seen this guy in years, since he's become a married man. <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm good, how are you? Thank God, what a privilege to see you. Yeah, I've been meeting to come on for a few weeks, but it's been a while. I, I have wow. been you're forgetting. Have you finished your degree and all that? I finished in YU. I'm actually in Tesmio now. We made LES. No way. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. great. So you're in Haifa? Yeah, we're in Haifa. Nice. Oh, that gives me an excuse to visit Haifa. That's great. Yeah, for sure. We'd love to see you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Nice. All right. So, so far, it's like Israel two to one on this uh, right now. There's, there's a couple of guys that are going to come in from California. I have a lot of respect for them because it's like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning. And most of them uh, are probably, you know, late risers, let's just say. Um, <clears throat> Eli, I'm glad that you're having these Zoom shears because on Shabbat, I desperately wanted to learn the Parsha for this past weekend, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't for other reasons. And so I always said to my husband, you know, St. Louis, he's got the shears going on. I'm just going to listen to him, and he's more entertaining. <laughs> so okay. I mean, I don't know if I'm more entertaining. I mean, we'll, we'll have Oh, you're 100% more entertaining things. than my Torah. I mean, I like my Torah books, my Midrash, but even though it's a children's Midrash, and don't mock me for uh -huh. that, <laughs> but I definitely I find you more. Actually, um, I was learning with Reb Machlis today, and uh, there was something that I learned with uh, the kids in the Midrash says on Tanakh, and I quoted it to him and he hadn't heard it before. So it was like, it was just so crazy. Uh, so I sent it to him and then he sent me a whole list of praise, which I wasn't uh, accepting. And then he sent me back like a quote from Pirkei Avot. There was no way to win, you know, it was, uh, but uh, it was very nice. Eli, is right. the Zoom, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to cut you off, man, but your Zoom, I don't know if it's yours or the window's like flicking. Just letting you know, man. Just letting you know. It's yeah, it's flicking. Does anyone else see that? Sean, Bianca, am I flicking out? No. No, then all right, honey. It could be your connection, Sam. Okay, then it's an old computer. All right, never mind. Dismiss me. I mean, just regard me. Then. All right, great. Hey, Gil. Yagshamesh. Yagshamesh. Nice. All right. I'm going to start now because we usually wait, give people the five minute, you know, Jewish time. So it's a good thing we don't do Sephardi time because then it would start like three hours later. Um, I came to this realization um, that uh, regardless of how many people are in, you know, while we're doing it, 
there's like a lot more people that actually watch the video afterwards. And uh, one of my fraternity brothers, uh, PK, was watching it and uh, he shared to me that he did not understand like half of what I was talking about. And that's because I was really tailoring it towards the people who were on the call and didn't think about maybe there's people who don't know Hebrew words or don't know certain Jewish concepts. Uh, so I'm going to attempt to, uh, I guess, uh, explain things a little more basically or use less uh, yeshivish words and so on and so forth. So you'll understand that I do that. Uh, I may just lapse into it, but who knows? We'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, in any event, today's class is in memory of uh, Vicky Nagar, ala shalom. That is uh, Albert Nagar's wife. Um, Albert is the person that was kind enough to uh, really uh, donate all of the things that we had in our Beit Midrash in Bergenfield, from the chairs, which we still have here in Israel, uh, to the tables, to the shelves, to the Sifre Torah, which we still have. They were actually... We use a Sefer Torah and a Corona Minion this Shabbat, uh, right outside. Um, so I wanted to do a little bit of Hakarata Tov, a little bit of gratitude. Um, you know, gratitude is something which is essential in terms of uh, living our lives to the fullest. And when we appreciate the things that people have done for us, even though, you know, 10 years have passed, 15 years have passed, whatever, it's really so important. So uh, I told Albert that we were doing this year in uh, Vicky's memory and uh, he was very appreciative. And you know, all of us, anyone who has been into my house uh, in those days, so on and so forth, we all really owe uh, Albert and Vicky a, of, a debt of gratitude. So I wanted to, uh, to just mention that. Um, so, oh, somebody else signed in. Let me just greet them. Ah, Hanania, how you doing Hanania? Great to see you. Doing okay, um, thank you, Ed. Great. Um, all right, so in any event, we are going to uh, work on, uh, now it's last week's Parsha for everybody, um, as we have rejoined the Israel reading of the uh, Torah with the diaspora reading of the Torah. Uh, but I had promised to, to address a couple of issues. Um, so last week's Parsha, Parshat Balak, focuses on this uh, evil sorcerer dude, so his name is Bilam. Um, I added in dude, but um, he probably wasn't really such a great dude. But um, So Bilam was hired to come and curse the Jewish people, whatever that means. And uh, I wanted to address the issue of what was his role. We, we spoke a little bit about the concept of Zula Mwadzu, or one thing parallels the other. And we were talking a little bit about the yin-yang, the concept of the yin-yang, which is not necessarily a Jewish, uh, definitely not a Jewish uh, symbol, but there is some truth to it. And the concept that there has to be this kind of balance in the world between good and evil um, in order for there to be a fair choice in terms of free will. So uh, the Midrash and many other commentators talk about Bilam, this kind of evil prophet who did have power, being the opposite spectrum in terms of evil, evil, um, and being the counterbalance to Moshe, because we know Moshe was uh, Moses was really the person who achieved the highest degree of prophecy, and Bilam, in terms of the nations of the world, he was the counterbalance. Uh, we mentioned that uh, Rabbi Naor, in his uh, introduction to Orot, Rav Cook's uh, seminal work. He speaks about uh, Rav Kook and Nietzsche, the famous uh, philosopher, also kind of playing this role in the, in the modern world. And one can go into many different examples throughout human history as to how it's really important to have uh, you know, balance and how there is balance in the world. But I wanted to bring up a very famous uh, story which is found in the Talmud, which makes this uh, kind of balance idea very, very personal. So it's in the Gemara uh, Sukkah, and it's a famous, famous story about the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, uh, the base level of, of human beings. So what happens is, is that um, there's, a, there's a rabbi, and he's traveling on his way, and he sees another rabbi, and he is accompanied by a very beautiful woman. And they're kind of walking up ahead. And uh, the first rabbi decides, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chaperone these two to make sure that, uh, you know, no monkey business goes on. 
Um, this, by the way, for those of you that were involved in NCSY, that is a Jewish youth group, this was the first like advisor guy that kind of ruined all your fun on Shabbat tones when you were trying to, you know, engage in certain activities. And there was that guy that was kind of making sure that you weren't alone with anyone. So that all started with uh, with this with this uh, Gemara. Actually, it didn't. There's there's other uh, there's other points in the Talmud where there were other people, but I just like to to wing that in. All right. So in any event, so uh, this this rabbi is following this uh you know this this man and this woman and they're traveling and then all of a sudden they come to a juncture in the road and they split up and the man goes in one direction and the woman goes in the other direction and uh the rabbi who was following them was like wow you know if it was me there is no way that something wouldn't have happened you know i mean look look how beautiful that woman was and then he stops for a moment and he catches himself and he thinks you know wow i'm a pretty disgusting person i mean you know, like I see a beautiful woman, I see a man walking away. The first thing I think about, that's all I'm thinking about, that they're going to, you know, that they're going to hook up. That's, that's where my mind is. And he fell into this like kind of bit of depression. He was very sad. He was like, you know, I've been learning and I've been working on myself. And this is, this is where I'm at. You know, that's what I think about. So um, something miraculous takes place. And uh, Eliyahu Navi, Elijah, the prophet, uh, who is a, 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 a person of, of great magnitude throughout Jewish folklore and the Talmud, so on and so forth. He comes out throughout Jewish history. Um, also, he, he comes to every Brit Milah. Um, the, the reason behind the Brit Milah, the circumcision, is fascinating because he actually criticized the Jewish people to God. And he said, look, they don't even do the Brit Milah. They don't even do the circumcision. And God was like, oh, you're, you're going to criticize people? You know what? Let's, uh, let's see, in the future, you're gonna have to visit every single Brit Milah that takes place. Um, the Talmud actually talks about the speed of different angels and different uh, spiritual beings, and Eliyahu is like speed. Uh, I've always been you know, questioning how he's never gotten a DWI, you know, going from Seder to Seder, but uh, that's a whole other discussion that we could have in the future. So in any event, so Elijah the prophet appears to this uh, rabbi and he says, look, don't be so depressed. Don't be upset with yourself that you had those kinds of thoughts. And he shared with him a very profound idea. He said, commensurate with a person's evil inclination, equivalent to the person's potential to sink and to do bad things, is the potential for him to rise and to do good things. In other words, if a person has a great Yetzirah, a great evil inclination, and is tempted by all these different crazy things, they should know that they have an equally strong Yetzirah Tov, good inclination, and they have the ability to rise to very great heights of spirituality and ethics and morality, so on and so forth. So this is a very comforting uh, thought for many of us, uh, but it tells us that Basically, we all have this equal potential for good and for evil. And that as deep as the evil may go, so too, that's the depth of the good that we can go. And there are many stories of different uh, people uh, that, that kind of flipped from one side to the next, that uh, at one point were very great and then they fell, and at one point they were very weak and they rose up. And we should know for ourselves that each one of us also has that potential. Um, now, I saw a very fascinating idea um, in a book called uh, The Jewish Book of Life After Life. Biana, are you going to do the um, teleprompting for us? So this is by Rabbi Dov Bear Pinson, who has a big presence on Facebook. Uh, he is a Chabad rabbi. Uh, I think he got into trouble with Chabad because he like visited the Pope with the group and played some music over there or something like that. Um, those that were in BCHSJS, you may remember it from this book, Jewish Wisdom on the Afterlife. Um, this is the book we had. The Jewish Book of Life After Life is kind of a, um, a redo of that, uh, oops, of that uh, book. I'm not quite sure what just happened. All right, yeah, here we go. I'm going to try to send you now the quote. Hey, Charles. I didn't see you there. I want you to know, Charles, that I got many comments on your snake story, and I may be forced to, um, you know, ask you to tell another silly or crazy story. Um, I have to think of, you know, a topic, but 
you know, there's always something. All right, so here is the quote. I'm sorry if it's gonna be uh, sideways. Let's see if this is actually what I'm looking for. Yes, okay. Um, so this is a fascinating idea. So the question is, is usually asked, you know, how do I know what like my mission in life is? How do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, so it used to be that there were great people like the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, a famous Kabbalist who lived in the uh, 16th century that was on such a high level, he'd be able to, to see a person and share with them, um, you know, ideas of what their purpose was. Um, others say that based on what you have the most pressure in terms of your Yetzirahara, your evil inclination, like if there is a certain area that you are having uh, serious challenges with vis-a-vis uh, -vis overcoming, know that that's probably why you're here. That's probably, you know, part of the reason that you're here. Um, the Bali Musar talk, the great P uh, masters of ethics talk about how when a person is challenged in a certain area, it could be that that's the whole uh, purpose of their coming into the world and their tikkun, what they have to fix. So the question is, well, how do I know that? So I found this fascinating quote in this book from Rabbi Pinson, and uh, I'll read it together with you if you haven't read it. According to the Arizal, in order for a person to do ch real tshuva, they need to know the source of their neshama, of their soul, and to know their previous incarnations, who they were in their previous uh, lives. The Ben Ishchai writes that in today's day and age, when we do not have an Arizal to reveal the source of our soul to us, Hashem places within the heart of man the knowledge and ability to do what is necessary for his soul's tikkun. In other words, each person will be naturally drawn towards that which needs tikkun. Tikkun means fixing or rectification. If it is a positive deed, one will be drawn to these actions. If it is a negative deed, then one will also be drawn to these negative actions and the purpose is to refrain from them in order to affect the necessary tikkun or rectification. That is a, a, from a book called Dath Utvuna, which is uh, the Ben Ishchai's introduction to Kabbalah. Um, it is not translated into English um, because the Ben Ishchai actually forbade um, his uh, Kabbalistic works to be translated into any other language. Um, I guess that's a snippet, so it's okay. But I had not seen that idea myself. I, of course, ordered the book uh, right away. I had uh, seen it and learned parts of it. Um, but after seeing that quote, I really needed to, to jump in. So in any event, I thought that that was a, a very fascinating idea. Um, ah, yes. Thank you, Gil. That's, uh, there's definitely a crossover. All right. Um, next, I wanted to share, there's a famous uh, Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. I assume that many of you probably have a Pirkei Avot handy. Uh, I will read it anyways. And it, of course, addresses uh, Bilam, this uh, evil sorcerer that tried to uh, curse us. And uh, it really is a, a Mishnah. It's in the, if you have the art scroll, uh, it's, I'm sorry to use the art scroll, but it's what was handy. It's a 522 Mishnah. Chapter 5, uh, Mishnah 22, so hey, cuff that. And it talks about this individual, Bilam, and tells us uh, some negative character traits and compares and contrasts with Avram Avinu. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it in English. Uh, those that want to read in Hebrew are more than welcome. So it says, whoever has the following three traits is among the disciples of our forefather Abraham. And whoever has three different traits is among the disciples of the wicked Balaam. Now, I think it's very interesting to note that there is no mention here of like Jewish ancestry or birth, so on and so forth. It seems that this applies to any human being that uh, practices or that shows these three traits. So he goes on to say, those who have a good eye, a humble spirit and a meek soul are among the disciples of our forefather, Abraham. I'm gonna explain that in a moment. And those who have an evil eye, an arrogant spirit, and a greedy soul are among the disciples of the wicked Bilam. So let's take those three and kind of try to explain them. So what does it mean an evil eye? So in 
general, in Jewish literature, there is this concept of an ayin hara, an evil eye, which is basically being jealous of someone else or looking badly at someone else. And that causes a uh, list of different spiritual uh, ramifications. And I'm not going to really go into that idea right now. It's a, it's a long kind of talk about the evil eye. But I'd like to talk about it on a, on a very kind of simple level, which I believe is a little bit more practical. And that is the concept of there are some people that no matter what they see, they always kind of see the bad side of it, right? No matter what news happens, they've got to focus on the negativity. And that's what I think the, the ayin hara that we're talking about here is. Not that they're mutually exclusive to the mystical dimension of the ayin hara or the evil eye, but I think it's very practical that we, uh, we ourselves, sometimes something happens or we see something, we always kind of jump to conclusions and look at the negative side and use our, our, our bad eye. And this obviously is uh, conducive to losing one's mind and driving everybody around us absolutely crazy. Because if you're always the Debbie Downer and you're always pointing out the flaw or the bad point or the negativity, right? So not only do you bring everyone else down, but of course you bring yourself down. Now, I'm not saying that a person shouldn't use critical analysis and be, you know, shouldn't be smart about analyzing things and you know trying to see whether or not this is the right thing to do you know obviously we all have to make judgments every day in terms of choices in terms of investment so on and so forth and we need to of course be critical when we choose what to do with our lives and what to do with our time and what we to do with our money however there is a specific malady in which a person is just in constant negative mode like that's their default switch and when i notice if that's my 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 default switch that anytime anything happens or someone says something or i read something whatever i automatically jump into negativity and critique so that could be problematic because at the end of the day you know at least we should have a, a balance uh, what the others would say is the good eye that's evidenced by Avram Avinu, and uh, we mentioned Ramachlis earlier, he is probably the expert at this, to always see the good side of things, to always see the positive, to always try to be optimistic uh, in terms of life and world events. Um, so something to think about, uh, something to consider, to ask ourselves, you know, what is my immediate reaction to things? Am I always kind of looking down or am I always lo kind of looking up? And how do I find a uh, healthy balance between those two uh, extremes? The second idea which he brings is the arrogant spirit. The arrogant spirit is thinking for whatever reason that I'm always better than somebody else, right? It could be that I'm smarter than them. It could be that I'm more handsome than them, or it could be that I have more money than them, whatever it may be. But this is also a very, very bad default setting when everybody that I know, for whatever reason, is lower than I am. And I have some reason to push myself higher than them. Um, Rev. Yisrael Salanter um, was known to say that if you want to build, you want to build yourself up, if you want to make yourself higher than somebody else, there are two ways of doing it. Either you can dig a hole and put the other person in, or you can kind of make, a, make a, a, a mountain and put yourself on top of it. Um, so obviously, putting other people down is not the best way to make ourselves up. Um, if anything, it really brings us both down. So it's really important when we you think about other people, you know, yes, it could be that objectively speaking, we are more intelligent than that person, or we have better skill sets, so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean that that person is invalidated and that person doesn't have anything that uh, they can do better than me or that they can't be, uh, you know, a person that's moving up and becoming better and better. So it's just, again, something to think about. And, you know, now and day in today's very, very difficult political climate, and I, you can't even look at Facebook anymore without seeing some kind of inane altercation about whatever it may be. Um, we, we even had, you know, a little, little, whatever I posted something about like, 
you know, penny stocks and on, you know, mind altering substance selling uh, companies. And that led to some kind of like, you know, altercation. Like I, I thought that was like it, but see, Gil is very laughing because he knows that one of the reasons I posted that was for his amusement. But um, yeah, at the end, by the way, everyone should know like 90% of the cryptocurrency things I post, I post only for Gil. Um, the rest of you enjoy them, you know, good for you, but uh, it's mainly for Gil. All right, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's just so easy to fall into this like vast negativity and get, you know, upset, you know, and this person wasn't wearing a mask and these people are doing this and, you know, and at the end of the day, like everyone ends up, you know, just, you all suck, you know, everybody on the right, on the left. And, you know, it's just a very unhealthy way of kind of looking at the world. And it certainly isn't something that, uh, you know, is, is positive. So something to think about. And then the, uh, the third negative trait that is mentioned about uh, Bilam is a greedy soul. A greedy soul refers to a person that is never satisfied with what they have. It could be vis-a-vis -vis material possessions. It could be in terms of finances, money. It can be in terms of relationships. Um, the list goes on and on. But there, are, there is a kind of sickness, a disease, which doesn't allow me to be happy unless I have certain things that are external to me. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the uh, Rabbi Zelig Pliskin's uh, uh, Gateway to Happiness, although I will mention that uh, Rav Matis uh, Shulman, Rabbi Dr. Matis Shulman, uh, shared with me a book called The Happiness Trap, uh, which had some very fascinating information in it. But at the end of the day, uh, you, I don't know if you want to put that up, Yana, but um, the ha I don't have it right in front of me, but there's uh, a regular version and an illustrated version. Uh, I believe it has to do with CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but in any event, the idea being that um, most people are kind of wired. We've been taught by the media to uh, think that unless I have X, Y, Z, I'm not going to be happy. And X, Y, Z can be, you know, one of many things. And we tend to base our happiness on what we don't have as opposed to what we do have. In other words, I'm going to be sad because I don't have X, Y, Z. I'm not going to think about all the things that I do have. I'm not going to think about, you know, the many things that I had that I said, oh, I'll only be happy if I have this. And now I have those, but just like a child after you know playing with the toy for 24 hours, boom, I'm on to the next thing. Um, so this is something that we have to consider. It's something that's, uh, you know, even if we think we've gone beyond uh, wanting certain physical possessions or whatever it is, it's something that can easily creep back in. And it's so important to take stock and to make sure that we do not allow our lack of things to determine our state of mind. Uh, now, of course, there are some times that this becomes a, gra a grave reality. It could be that a person, God forbid, doesn't have food, doesn't have medicine. So we're not talking about the, you know, the, the real situations of lack. We're talking about like, you know, oh, I want a Ferrari or, you know, I, I want an Xbox One. Only some of you, of course, will uh, appreciate those two references. Uh, probably maybe Gil. I don't know when you when you stop watching South Park, but um, Charles, I expect you to have some knowledge of that as well. In any event, so those are the uh, three negative traits uh, of Bilam of Balam, and uh, of course the opposite, which is uh, Avraham Avinu. All right, let's move on. And uh, I thought that there was a beautiful illustration of the principle of mida keneged mida, measure for measure, or what's known in regular English uh, nomenclature, what goes around comes around in, uh, in this week's Torah portion. Um, so Balaam is riding his donkey. Um, I did not choose the other word, although I, I will add that I have a certain children's book. I think it's called The Story of the Parsha. And when I was reading it with my daughter uh, a year ago, I had to ad-lib the word that it used for donkey. Um, clearly, the authors are still, you know, existing in the world, I guess, 50 years ago when the word ass was used as a donkey. 
Uh, I did not choose to use that word with my five-year-old child because they could probably repeat it elsewhere, which would not be uh, accepted. Uh, but at the end of the day, there you go. So he was riding on his donkey and uh, there was this angel of God that appeared and tried to uh, kind of uh, sway away the donkey from continuing. And the donkey smashes into this uh, hill or wall, whatever we want to call it, a uh, pile of rocks and crushes uh, Balaam's foot, making him somewhat lame. He was lame anyways, but now he's like physically lame. So uh, what was that all about? So if you, if we go back, there was a very fascinating event that took place with Jacob and his sons in the book of Genesis and his father-in-law, Lavan, who I have affectionately nicknamed Whitey because that's what his name was. Um, so in any event, what ha happens? What happens is Lavan chases after Jacob and he's going to, you know, maybe kill them. And God appears to him and says, if you do anything, if you even look at Jacob the wrong way, you're toast. You guys are all gone. So they go, they meet them, and there's this whole showdown. And then they come to this agreement that they're going to make a monument to the agreement that they've put together. So they make this agreement that neither of us are going to hurt each other. And then they pile up all these rocks. And that, that rock pile or mountain or mound, whatever we want to call it, will testify against whoever crosses over it in order to attack the other person. So fascinatingly, Bilam is a direct descendant of Lavan. And the Kabbalah actually talks about a spiritual connection between them. Uh, but if we understand it even on a simple level, that Bilam was a direct descendant of Lavan, and Lavan had promised that he and his, you know, his descendants are not going to cross this and, and hurt uh, Yaakov's children. And lo and behold, here is Bilam doing that. And this very mound that they set up ends up crushing his leg and causing him to uh, no longer be able to walk normally. So that's definitely a uh, interesting example of what comes around, goes around. I also wanted to share a fascinating uh, Midrash homily on the uh, donkey. We know that what happens right after that episode, yes, that's really brilliant, Gil. Perhaps that is the parallel there. We're going to talk about the uh, parallels. Beautiful. Um, so in any event, what happens is, is that um, uh, Bilam is riding on his donkey, and all of a sudden, the donkey, like, talks to him in a very, like, uh, Eddie Murphy, um, well, I don't know, like, maybe we could say Shrek, now, there, there was another film, I think, that had Eddie Murphy talking to animals in it, whatever. That's how old I am. But uh, so, and it's like, you know, and he's like, uh, you know, why, why are you hitting me? You know, it's almost comedic in a way. So, uh, and then they have this whole discussion back and forth in which Bilam is totally humiliated by this donkey, like telling him off. Um, and so there's a, another mission in Turkey Avot that says, that there were several things that were created um, in, in the uh, twilight period. And one of them was the mouth of the donkey. So this mouth of the donkey, the fact that this donkey was able to speak to Bilam and tell him off, was actually programmed into creation from the get-go. I'm going to share in a moment where that uh, donkey mouth comes up again in Tanakh in the Bible. But first, just to point out a very fascinating uh, concept I was learning with Ramathlis today, and that is the how do we define the difference between a human being and animals? So there's a whole bunch of different opinions. Uh, what most of you know is that Unculus, the famous uh, Aramaic translator of the, uh, of the uh, Torah, uh, states that it's the ability to speak. And that is, uh, you know, to, to use complex words. Now, we know that many animals are able to communicate. For example, the birds, have you heard? Uh, birds, um, again, only certain people will understand that. I'm not going to sing the song. Um, but, so... We know that animals, there's certain birds, for example, that have memorized hundreds of words and they can identify shapes and they can identify colors. We know that whales have a highly complex uh, way of communicating with each other. Uh, and, you know, insects and, and many other creatures that can communicate. Of course, they, 
to our knowledge, they don't have the uh, language skills or the vocabulary, so on and so forth, but surely we know that they can communicate. Um, in any event, if we fast forward many, many years in the future to the book of Judges, we come into the famous character of Samson, uh, Shimshon, famous of Samson and Delilah. So we know that Samson, uh, in his early career as a judge, is actually uh, given over to the Philistines by the uh, people of uh, Israel. Um, that is because the Philistines basically threatened them and said, look, if you don't give this guy over, we're going to take you all out. And Samson himself agreed that he could be handed over to them. Uh, they tied, allowed them to tie him up and they gave him over uh, because Samson, for him, it was really a secret attack ambush. So what happens is he's given to the Philistines. He has no weapons. So what does he do? And by the way, Samson, according to some people, is also lame, which is very interesting because he was super strong. Um, he was the guy, for those that remember, with the long hair, and that was the source of his power. Um, so what happens is he slays, I think it's 500 Philistines, with the jawbone of the donkey, right? So the uh, sources say that this jawbone was the same exact jawbone. It was, in fact, Bilaam's donkey that had died that day. It was killed by the angel after it told off Bilaam. And it had waited there for Shimshon A to slay the Philistines with. And then what happens right afterwards, yet another miracle takes place with that jawbone, that Shimshon is uh, famished. He's really very thirsty, and he's, like, passing out. And then water comes out of that jawbone and uh, quenches his thirst. So I thought that was just a very you know, fascinating uh, idea, fascinating midrash. Um, and one could probably trace uh, so many of these different uh, kind of objects. Um, next week, perhaps, we'll speak about the coat of many colors uh, that was given to... Uh, to Yosef, but uh, was really used by Yaakov, was used by Esav. Um, there is actually some fascinating archeological evidence that was found in Egypt um, that God willing, I'll share with you next week. Uh, I'm about to finish a book called Pharaoh, uh, which attempts to go through the different uh, dynasties as David Attenborough would call them, uh, as opposed to dynasties. Um, Hanania, that was for you, by the way. Um, and basically takes a look at uh, what was going on. So God willing, next week, I will share with you this absolutely fascinating uh, archaeological find that uh, basically they found a statue of a guy with red hair wearing a cloak of many colors. The theory is, is that that is of Asa who killed Nimrod to get that cloak, but we'll, we'll talk about that next week. And then there were two cloaks, so you know where did, where did they come from? So that's a little teaser for next time. Um, in any event... The uh, book review that I wanted to do today is a book that um, I saw quoted in another book. It is called For Goodness Sake. It is uh, Inspirational Stories of Chesed. Uh, these really short stories, two pages of like very nice things that people have done. And the story that I just wrote with, uh, read with Ora, my daughter, was about Rabbi Mendel Kaplan, who was a Rebbe in Chicago. Uh, he is no longer in this world. But basically, what would happen was he would drive every Thursday to Yeshiva, and he would always, uh, he would go from Chicago to New York, and uh, he would always pick up hitchhikers. Even if there was a danger or whatever, he would always pick up hitchhikers. So he picked up this hitchhiker, and he talked to him, and he was, like, really nice to him. And uh, what happened was, is that um, it was time to, uh, you know, he got to New York, and the hitchhiker was about to get out of the car, and he tells him... I want you to know that I had no intention of going anywhere when I hitched the ride with you. I actually spend my time flagging down drivers. And when I'm about to get out of the car, I take out my gun and he took out his gun and he's like, and I robbed them. And when I got into the car today, I had every intention of robbing you as well, but you were just so nice to me that I couldn't do it. And with that, he quickly got out of the car and walked away. So that was just a great story. The stories that I've read so far are all like that. They're like cutesy, like uh, stories of like, you know, co comedic nature. Um, so I wanted to very much share that book with you. Um, the second book that I just started um, is a book by, I, I'm going to start with the, the prelude. 
Um, this is a book called Out of the Depths um, by Rabbi Lau. He was, he was the uh, chief rabbi of Israel. This is an absolute must read. Why is it a must read? Well, because it's really three books in one. The first part of the book talks about his adventures or his, uh, uh, his time during the Holocaust in Buchenwald. Um, the second part of the book talks about him coming to Israel in the early years of the nascent state and has lots of history about what happened and how he was close with many, many great uh, righteous people um, that, that were alive at that time. And then the third part of the book talks about his rise to become the chief rabbi of Israel. And there's a great, great picture. Uh, this should sell the book for you. There's a picture that when he was the chief rabbi of Israel, he actually traveled to Cuba and he met with Fidel Castro. And Fi here's the picture here. I mean, I, I hope you guys can see that. It's just such a ridiculous photograph. And Fidel Castro actually gave him some cigars to bring back uh, to, uh, to some of the diplomats in, uh, in Israel. Um, this is a riveting, riveting read. I just wanted to share some divine providence that took place. So I read this book two, three times. Uh, I read it over with, with uh, Sarah, my daughter. And um, here's what happened. So I noticed that the Hebrew version was translated by someone by the name of uh, Jessica Setbon. Now, it's like, hold on, that name sounds very familiar. So many years ago, when our family was uh, vacationing in the south of France, um, growing up, my parents had a beach house in La Ciotat, which is in the south of France. So we would go there every summer. So there was a guy there by the name of Charlie Septon. He was a very nice uh, French guy. And he used to like, you know, just take care of us when we were at the beach, so on and so forth. Really super sweet guy. So uh, I hadn't seen him for a while. And then we reconnected. He moved to, uh, to Israel. And the crazy story is he went to Japan for business. And he met this girl from Texas there, uh, you know. Uh, and basically, they got married and they moved to Netanya. So uh, Beck and I went to, to visit them while, before we got married. And uh, so we got to meet Jessica there, so on and so forth. So I'm like, hold on a second, is this the same Jessica? So I found, of course found her on Facebook and I sent her a message and it is her, it's in fact her. So um, two years ago when we went to Netanya uh, with my, my, my family, my father, Lava Shalom was with us. And so we had this like reunion and we got to, uh, we got to see them again. And it had been like years that we had, and she was so nice. She sent us like a couple of copies of other books that she had translated, so on and so forth. That's a little uh, Hashkacha Prata story for you. In any event, so one of the main points, uh, parts of the book is Rabbi Lau was really, really saved countless times by his brother, Naftali. His brother, Naftali, became a diplomat and uh, ended up writing his own book. And that book is the book that I just started. And Biana, it's called Balaam's Prophecy. I don't know if you can see that. You can read it. But it's uh, his experiences through the Holocaust and then being a diplomat uh, in Israel and in New York, so on and so forth. He was very dear friends with uh, Natan Sharansky, uh, among many other people. Here is a picture of him with uh, Begin and Moshe Dayan on the, on the cover. Um, so I try to read a little bit that has, you know, some history in it, so on and so forth. And... I found it really interesting. I had just finished the uh, Rebetzin book about Rebetzin Young Rise that I had spoken about, and I wanted a book that had a little bit of history, a little bit about the Holocaust, so on and so forth. And I thought it was just kind of crazy that I picked it up on Shabbat, a Parshat Balak. That's just when it happened that uh, I started the book. So uh, yeah, so that is my uh, you know my book suggestions for the week. Um, I wanted to ask perhaps for next week, for whoever is still brave enough to attend, uh, I had promised that maybe we'd have some guest speakers. Uh, my dear friend, Rev. Gedalia Gerfein, who Charles has namakered the supermarket sweep uh, rabbi. So he is a, uh, a, a very dear friend and a mentor. I actually uh, have said many times, 
he taught me how to teach, how to interject all sorts of amusing stuff into the middle of the, the sermons, which obviously causes some people to suffer, but some people really enjoy it. Um, so he started something called the People's Talmud, uh, which is an online database of uh, different quotes from the Talmud, different pictures provided by the B'Tselah Art Academy, videos. We have people that are going to be uh, providing content, everyone from the Steinsalz to Breslev to Chabad. And um, I have joined his team of the People's Talmud. And uh, he has offered to give like a 15, 20 minute like introduction. And when he, 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 his teaching is just absolutely amazing. Um, so perhaps if the uh, group would not mind or would like, uh, I'll teach for a half an hour and then the two of us will come on and he'll give this like kind of mini presentation. Um, so if people uh, would like that and you'll get to meet my, my mentor, which is also I, I think of interest to some of you. Uh, so perhaps uh, we shall do that next week. All right, we'll open up to questions, comments, um, crazy stories from the ER, uh, whatever you ladies and gentlemen would like. Hey, Shmuel Kaplan, how you doing, man? Pleasure to see you. Mr. Mamone, also great to see you. Shmuel, I cannot hear you because you are muted. I give you permission with my... I'm, I'm mute. I'm mute. Sorry, there was some background noise that I wasn't aware I was muted. Good to see we you, man. We love to see the kids. We love to see the kids, Shmuel. So please don't hesitate. It gives us great joy. <laughs> I Definitely. think you guys have outnumbered us. I think of all the, the Chavra, Baruch Hashem, I think you may have more children than any, any of we got, us. In the we've officially got a Brady Bunch. We got three girls, three boys. That's awesome, man. Kane, your boo and many many Thank blessings him. that's awesome so charles you got a you got some you know all right so yeah i got one okay charles, I'm gonna, to uh, hear. you definitely have more gray hair than me uh but this is coming in really hard and um you know i think i, I think you guys were joking when Oru was born that she was going to put me over the edge little did you guys know that when she would become 13, going on like 18, that was what was really going to do me in with the gray hair. But uh, all right. So in any event, anyone have a question or comments or, you know, anything that they would like to add? I do have a question. Um, this might be sound a little, sorry, I'm off colored regarding, I think I got the Billam and Bala confused a bit because it's been a while. But um, anyways, mm -hmm. You mentioned about how one of them had power, but I'm confused what you mean like by power because like at the end of the day, like you don't mean by king's power per se, because like king back then in the day there were kings and they had power, but like that's the kind of power I'm thinking you're referring to. But then you say when they have bad speech, like you like you could talk bad about anyone, so to speak, and that's not the nicest thing to do, but that's power, but it's like not like you're trying to beat them. You're just saying like, oh, Nancy or Joe was nasty person and they're all like that's different that's, than, a, that's a great sorry, question Sam. <clears throat> and I'm not sorry. only that but i have to just share that that's exactly what i was learning with ramachlis today we, we were learning the mitzvah and sefer chinuch that we are not allowed to curse a person and there are two dimensions of that the first dimension is that the person will feel bad like you're saying because you've cursed them but the second dimension is that a person has power with what they say, that our words hold power in the spiritual realm. Bilam was an individual who had the power, so to speak, to curse people, or according to other people, he knew the right time spiritually that he could say a curse and it would be effective. Um, by the way, there are dozens of commentaries that discuss this back and forth, so I'm just sharing two. But the idea being that, that Bilam did have some source of spiritual power. He knew things that rationally, scientifically, I guess, one could not normally know. And he is seen as, as a person that, uh, you know, really had great potential, unfortunately used it for, for evil. He ends up, by the way, telling the Moabites and the Midianites that the way to defeat the Jews is through... Uh, licentiousness, and then we'll probably talk a little bit more about this next week, what happens at the end of the Parsha, uh, which some people call the Shish Kebab Parsha. Um, well, I don't know how many people call it that, but somebody called it that and it just stuck. 
You know, Charles, I would have at least expected a snicker there because I think you may be the person that nom occurred at that, if I, if I think. But uh, all right, so yeah, Sam. So at the end of the day, um, all of us have power. The question is how much power we have, but uh, we have the ability to uh, say things that uh, can influence uh, others, both in a real way in this physical world and then in a real way in the spiritual world that, that we're not necessarily uh, privy to. So excellent question. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> two more, more comments than questions. Two things that came to mind when we were talking about the disciple of uh, Bilam Harasha. What I mentioned in the, the group chat is that there's this meme going around now about the Wendigo or the Wetiko, which is this kind of, you know, brain virus, you know, turning people into these rabid consumers of everything around them, you know, bottomless pits of consumption of other people, of their environment, whatever it is, no, nothing is ever enough. Every, everyone else must feed their, their need to, to be filled. And then it brought to mind actually Rambam at the beginning of the Moren Bukhim, the Guide for the Perplexed, where Rambam actually discusses the Chazal's view of the Shedim. And that a shade is basically a person, or a, a person, <laughs> you know, with the form, the physical appearance of a, of a human being, but lacking any kind of spiritual development, lacking a neshama. It seems like there's a strong connection there, especially if we're going to be contrasting Bil'am with Abraham Avinu, who instead of taking from the world, I mean, he says, did I even take, you know, like a shoelace from you guys? You know, like, you know, Abraham Avinu is the giver. He's the one who's he's the supporting the whole world. So there's a, it's definitely, it seems applicable to today's times where, you know, we've got this strong contrast. Are we consuming the people around us or are we building up the people around us? Well, that's brilliant. That's awesome. And I just want to make two comments to that. The first one is Rev Dessler in Strike for Truth, the Tamaliyah, who has that essay that he talks about people that have completely sold themselves, so to speak, to evil. And they are like, uh, I think, what do they call them? Window dressers for, for evil, right? That basically they get good things because Hashem has to make a ruse that you can be evil and still, you know, have all this good stuff. So they've given them. So I, I don't know if anyone remembers that essay, but it's definitely in English. And the second thing that you reminded me of, Gil, which is epic, and I didn't, I didn't remember this, is uh, Rev, Rev uh, Jeremy Kagan gave us a sheer on consumerism and on the spiritual uh, maledictions of it. And why not ask him if he'll come onto the Zoom and give us a sheer? You know, you just gave me that idea. Hell yeah. That would be awesome. So I definitely have to be in touch with him and uh, ask him if he'll give over that sheer on consumerism. I actually mentioned this in, um, in my Rick and Morty shear, uh, which has a lot of views on Facebook. Um, when I spoke at the very end of that Rick and Morty episode, the story train, um, uh, Rick kind of goes crazy and he's like, nobody's buying anything, you know? The whole economy is in shambles. Like, go buy something. So I spoke a little bit about it. I shared some of the ideas. Uh, but you just reminded me that we should for sure get... Uh, uh, Rev, uh, Rev Kagan on one of these Zooms and uh, addressing that issue. So, so thank you so much. Um, just as a, an additional aside, you also remem reminded me, I, I spoke about Rev Gedali in the People's Talmud. We're planning on having an event in August that will feature, God willing, both Rabbi Steinsaltz and Rabbi David Aaron speaking about the Talmud. That will be one of our flagship uh, video events. So thank you. It reminded me of several things, Gil. So that was awesome. You said you had a second uh, point. No, it was just the connection oh, to this the Native American too. concept and the Moren Nebuchim shade. I think that, you know, there's a, this was known to, to both to us and the rest of the world that it's possible for a person to go down this path where they look like a real human being, but they're a, an empty, bottomless pit inside. Nice, beautiful. And since you mentioned that like uh, merger between, you know, Native American and Musser, uh, I just told over Shabbat the story of when we had the great privilege of having Rabbi Yisrael Miller and Nicoma Caesar's dad. Uh, I, Charles, were you there for that, man? That was epic. 
we uh and, and we we got to like Wait, you know, like for, for which one we had shabbat with rabbi miller Yes. And Nicola's dad came. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. It was a huge discussion, and it was just, it was just epic. That was just yeah. such a great. We got to tag Nicola in this and and tell him because it was just fantastic. So that's what that brought to mind, Gil. Those, those were good times, man. So beautiful comment, thank you. And I'll have to remember now to be in touch with Rabbi Kagan. Charles, do you have a question or a comment or a story? Uh, well, I have an ER story. But, uh, did I tell you the story from right before Corona, the one with the lady with the heart block? No, we heard the the lady with the old lady with the snake. Yeah, the one who bashed the snake into oblivion and then brought it to the ER. She's like, yeah, this is my thing. Yeah, so I had a crazy situation happen uh, pretty recently, uh, relatively, I guess, because it was right before Corona started. Uh, there's a situation where um a person their natural pacemaker stops working and it's called complete heart block it's a really bad thing uh and the body has sort of like a fail safe to sort of address it and give you at least a little time to buy while you're trying to figure things out uh and uh but ultimately you got to jump on this real quick or the person involved unfortunately is going to die uh are you sure I didn't tell you the story, Eli? I, I, I don't recall it. Okay, so anyway, nobody else heard it. So this is a first-hand account. So this uh, normally when complete heart block occurs, it's in a really elderly person. Like I don't think I've I, I, I've commonly seen it in anybody under the age of eighty. You know, so it's it's a rare thing, and it's a rare thing. Like if I've been pre a physician for fifteen years, I see it maybe three times a year or less, okay? So it's not a thing that happens often. And I had a situation right before uh, Corona where this lady, she was 54, uh, and she was Hasidish, and she came into the ER, and uh, she's in complete heart block, and she's having a seizure, and most of the time when people have this, because they're not pumping enough blood to their brain, they're pretty out of it. So this lady had a heart rate of 15, in case you're wondering, the normal heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute, and her heart rate was 15. So she's not in a good way. So I called all my nurses, you know, all hands on deck, red alert, get everything ready. I call, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm calling the cardiologist in from home. I'm getting ready. We're going to try to place an emergency pacemaker, all this stuff, okay? And all of a sudden, the lady wakes up. And, you know, she stops seizing, she wakes up, she knows who she is, she knows where she is, she knows what's going on, okay? But her heart rate's still 15 beats a minute, and she could literally die at any moment. So, I'm sort of struggling at that moment, because the thing is, she could literally die at any moment, and the art scroll sitter basically says, when a person is on their potential deathbed, it's proper for them to see vidui. And the Shulchan Aruch brings down this whole formula where, that you're supposed to say to a person, where you say, you know, the situation's bad, it's proper to say you do it. It's, and the, the, the language of the Shulchan Aruch is, um, many people say you do it and they recover completely. Many people don't say you do it and they die anyway. If you say V Dui, it should be Zachus for you that you should uh, have a complete recovery. And everyone who says V Dui is guaranteed a Chelek and Olam Haba. Right? So I figured this lady, she could be dead in a couple of moments. Wouldn't it be really horrible if she didn't get a chance to say Vidui? She's awake and alert, at least right now. And um, on the other hand, you know, the non-Jewish personnel would think that I was insane. The Hasidic family are not necessarily going to uh, understand that, hey, like this is a, it's in the Shulchan Aruch, it's like the proper thing to do. Like, they're not, they're, they're not in the best state of mind right now when their loved one is standing like, is laying in that stretcher right there and they're outside the, the, the room and they're like really worried sick about it. And uh, not for nothing, I'm afraid, what if I scare the patient into getting worse? However, on the other hand, the Shulchan Aruch says, this is what you're supposed to say. So I hemmed and hawed for a few moments. I kicked everyone out of the room as, as, as you know, 
as they were going to do their jobs. And I decided, you know what, if Chazal say this, this is what it is. This is the proper thing to do. So I walk over to the lady and I say in a sort of a gentle voice, and I noticed that her family was eavesdropping at the door, but um, I walk over to the lady and say, ma'am, um, you know, I'm doing everything that I can to take care of you. We're gonna do everything to make sure that you're just fine. But I want to tell you that right now, the situation is very serious. Okay, it's a life-threatening situation, and at this time, it may be proper for you to say be doing. And I'm about to say the rest of the formula, and all of a sudden, these eyes like go wide, like she realizes what I'm saying to her, and I'm like, oh my god, did I just kill her? And boom, her heart kicks in, and it's going at 120 beats per minute normal, and she's fixed. Okay, a couple of. <laughs> A couple of moments later, the cardiologist walks in, he looks at the monitor and he starts yelling at me, he's like, would you call me in at three o'clock in the morning? She's fine, Rick's gonna wait until 6 a.m. I had to get out of bed for this. And at the end of the day, he took her up and they put in the emergency pacemaker because we didn't want to like rely on a miracle or anything. But uh, the moral of the story, at least I hope, is that you can't lose from trying to do the right thing and follow the words of the sages. Nice, that's great. Yashar Koach, Yashar Koach, the most awesome story. Thanks, Thank nice. you so much for sharing that. Yeah. That's like a crazy Thank story. You. Thank you. Yeah. That was very interesting. Yeah. I did have one medically in interesting question for you though regarding it. Um, that, that speech was very interesting and very heartwarming, but like how did her heart just all of a sudden go accelerate to normal. I just, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a good miracle. question. The answer is, I don't know. Oh, by the way, her family was not really so happy with me afterwards. And then I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. She needed a shock to the system. Like, oh, doctor, I understand. Very good, very good, you know. And they were pacified, but it was, uh, it was a little, uh, it was a little hairy. Nice, nice. That was crazy. Yeah. All right. Um, Charles, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everyone, it was such a pleasure to see you. God willing, we will uh, recommence next week. And uh, I will see if uh, Rev. Gedalia can join us. If not, I'll try to get uh, Rev. Kagan. And uh, once again, guys, real pleasure. If anyone wants to talk during the week, just uh, reach out to me and I'd love to uh, catch up. And I bless everyone with a Shavua Tov, easy and meaningful fast on Thursday. And all the best, guys. Stay yeah. safe. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah. Be well. See Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Eli? Yes. Good question. There's a fast on Thursday? Yes, it's the 17th of Tammuz on Thursday. Because I don't really, I only fast on um, Yom Kippur and Teshavav. I'm sorry. So I don't know. I've been told by my are rabbi. You still, are you still nursing? No. No? Okay. So we'll talk about it privately at another time, Sam. Don't worry about it. Can I ask you one other thing? I know that you know Charles for many, many years. How do you get an emergency pacemaker in in like a couple seconds? I have no idea. I'm not knowledgeable in the medical I field. I so. that, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so wait, is this fast? Is it like a serious, serious fast? Because I know, honestly, and it's no disrespect to you guys, to like any rabbi, but as I spoke to my local rabbi, and you know, who, I speak to him about kosher and everything, you know, all the whatever halakha stuff that I need to know, kosher's whatever, um, you know, whatever. Um, he tells me like some things like plastic, you don't have to tovel, fine, good, because it's kind of, you know, like back and forth to the mikvah. But like, I'm just confused of like why on Yom Kippur and Tishavav, is that how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, those two fast days are considered like the most important of the fast days. One of them is biblically mandated. The other one is is like the universal day. So they're much more stringent than the other ones. Okay. But you should definitely, definitely call your local rabbi and explain the situation. And he'll, he'll make a ruling for you whether you should fast or not on Thursday. Okay, yeah, I wasn't trying to be rude or anything. I was just confused. Yeah, not at all. Because last year I all asked about all these... Yeah, like, no, just real quick. Last time I asked, last year I asked them at all these, like, I think six fasts or whatever. And I told them that, medically speaking, I get low blood pressure. I don't want to bore you. I'm sorry. I just was wondering in case you're a rabbi too. But I do get low blood pressure once in a while. So he